The sermon today is titled, Leave it to God. And sometimes our life seems to be very complicated. It seems to be hardly comprehensible. If we only knew what the future holds. But many times, we don't know. But you know what? God does. But to begin with, notice what it's stated in James chapter 4. And let's look at verses 13 to 15. James 4, beginning in verse 13. It says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little while, for a little time, then it vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. You find a similar scripture in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 11. Ecclesiastes 11. And let's start reading in verse 1. It says, cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a serving to seven and also to eight, for you do not know what evil will be on the earth. When it says cast or give a serving to seven or to eight, some commentaries say, say that means you be generous towards others when you have opportunity, so that you may also receive their help in times of need. I'll just talk about diverse investments. Both possibilities are, in fact, possible. That doesn't sound that good, right? Both possibilities are possible. Both alternatives are possible would be a better way of putting it. But notice how it continues in verse 5. As you do not know what is the way of the wind, or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God, who makes all things. In the morning sow your seeds, and in the evening do not withhold your hands, for you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. So again, the point is being made, we just, we just don't know many times what the future holds, what the future will bring. Sometimes you might only understand much later why certain events had to take place in our lives in the way they did. Because God's ways are not our ways. And the Bible makes that point very clear time and again. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 6. It says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So that's why we should seek God in everything we do. Notice Isaiah chapter 43. And verse 1, Isaiah 43 and verse 1. But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel. But you might as well put your own name in here. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. And then he tells us, and when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, and they shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Let's stop right here. And let's apply it to your own life. And think about everything you have experienced so far. Is that true or is that not true? that God was with you no matter what happened. 
in your life. You see, God guides our steps in sometimes surprising and unexpected ways. His ways are many times different than what we might have thought, what we might have anticipated. Isaiah 43 and verse 13, we read, Indeed, before the day was, I am he, and there is no one who can deliver out of my hands. I work, and who will reverse it? Verse 16, thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea and a path through the mighty waters. An unexpected way. Nobody expects that God opens up the sea for us and shows us a way to get through that one. Verse 21, this people I have formed for myself, and they shall declare my praise. That's you and me. It says God has formed us for him so that we can declare his praise to others. And so we should, let, we should actually leave it to God. We should actually allow him to direct our ways. And we find that admonition time and again. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 1. Proverbs 16 and verse 1. It says, the preparations, what we might have in mind, what we may want to do, our plans, well, of the heart, they belong to man. But the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirits. And that's why it says, commit your works to the Lord, and then your thoughts will be established. I want to give you an interesting example of somebody who did just that, who turned it all over to God. I'm talking about Abraham's servant, who was asked to go to the place Abraham had come from and find a wife for Abraham's son, Isaac. Notice how the servant went about it. Genesis chapter 24. Beginning in verse 42. And this is what he then tells the relatives of Rebekah. And this day I came to the well and said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if you will now prosper the way in which I go, behold, I stand by the well of water, and it shall come to pass that when the virgin comes out to draw water, and I say to her, Please give me a little water from your pitcher to drink. And she says to me, Drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. But before I had finished speaking in my heart, there was Rebecca coming out with her pitcher on her shoulder, and she went down to the well and drew water. And I said to her, Please let me drink. And she made haste and let her pitcher down from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will give your camels a drink also. And so I drank, and she gave the camels a drink also. Verse 47. And when I asked her and said, Whose daughter are you? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So I put the nose ring on her nose and the bracelets on her wrists. And I bowed my head, bowed my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord God of my father, of my master Abraham, who had led me in the way of truth to take the daughter of my master's brother for his son. See, the servant had completely allowed God to direct him, to lead him, to guide him. And through a miracle, God revealed that this was the woman who was supposed to become the wife of Isaac. That was a good example. Now let's look at a bad one. Let's go to Daniel with me, Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5, beginning in verse 18. Here we're talking about an evil king. 
one who had greatly sinned against God. And notice what Daniel told him. Daniel 5, verse 18. He says, O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father or forefather, a kingdom and majesty, glory and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished he executed, whomever he wished he kept alive, whomever he wished he set up, whoever he wished he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. And then he was driven from the sons of men, his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys, and they fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. But you, his son, or grandson really, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. And you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. And they have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords, your wives, your concubines, have drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hands and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Interesting way how that is put. Who owns all your ways. It can also be translated in whose charge are all your ways. Or who has control over all your ways. And so what do we read as a consequence? Verse 30. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. He didn't honor God at all. He didn't recognize that God was in charge, should have been in charge of his life. And so this is what he incurred. I'd like to talk a little bit about some biblical admonitions and encouragements. First in Psalm 25. And in verse 12. Psalm 25 and verse 12. Who is a man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. Now, even a superficial reading of that scripture, the way it's translated here, tells me there's something wrong with the translation. It doesn't seem to make any sense. Well, a much better translation is in the Living Bible. It says, God will teach him how to choose the best. Or the RSV writes, him he shall instruct in the way that he should choose. Or the New American Bible reads, God shows them the way to choose. That is the way it should be translated. In other words, who is a man that fears God? Well, God will show him then what he should do. Also notice Psalm 32 and verse 8. Again, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go, and I will guide you with my eye. You see, time and again, God is showing us, if we let him, what we should do. He guides our steps. Notice Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs 21 and verse 1. Notice the control God has. It says, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9. 16, 9. A man's heart plans his way, 
but the Lord directs his steps. You see, sometimes we have ideas, we have plans, we have concepts, but if it doesn't fit with what God wants us to do, he will intervene, he will direct our steps. Through circumstances, through other means. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 24. A man's steps are of the Lord. How then can a man understand his own way? Sometimes we can, sometimes we cannot. Sometimes we have ideas and God says, no, not that way. And then he will make his will known. If we have ears to hear and eyes to see. Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23. Jeremiah 10 and verse 23. It says, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Strong statement. The point is this. One cannot walk alone without God to live a life which is in harmony with God. The Living Bible writes, I know it is not within the power of man to map his life and plan his course. The New Jerusalem Bible says, No one's course is in his control, nor it is in anyone's power, as he goes his way to guide his own steps. Because it is not in accordance with God's will, God will intervene. And that is especially true for those God has called in this day and age. Psalm 48 and verse 14. Psalm 48 and in verse 14. For this is God. Our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even to death. We'll talk about death in a moment. He will be our guide until the day we die. You see, even our times are in God's hands. We find that in Psalm 31. And verse 15, David knew that. Sometimes we think we are in control of our time. And then we find out, no, we're really not. We're really not. The day is 24 hours long, and it could be 36 hours, and we still don't get everything done, right? But we have to understand, God many times tells us, hey, now wait a minute, let's leave that alone. It's not that important right now. That's more important. Psalm 31, verse 15. My times are in your hands. In other words, he controls his time. His good time and also his bad time. So let's look at a few more examples to see how God controls our lives. Of course, Michael Ling in the sermonette talked about Elijah. I fortunately had not intended to talk about Elijah, so that's good. But I want to talk about Joseph as one example. And we all know the story. How the brothers sold him into slavery to Egypt. And because he stood up for what was right, he ended up in prison. And on and on it goes. And then finally the brothers came and Joseph revealed himself to them. Of course, they thought he was long gone. But notice what he says in Genesis chapter 50, beginning in verse 15. Genesis 50 and verse 15. Let's all pay close attention to this because that is something which we can perhaps learn in our lives too. And of course, that's not only for older people, it's also for younger people, for our teenagers, our children. They should also listen to this very carefully because sometimes things happen in their lives and they don't quite understand what's going on. Genesis 50 and verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, 
Perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph, saying, Before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, now whether he in fact did do that, I don't know. I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. And then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. And Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for I am or am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me. Oh, yeah. But God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, what was he talking about? How did he save many people alive? Well, let's go back to Genesis chapter 45 and verse 4. Genesis 45 and verse 4. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. Now I'm sure that the brothers didn't know that. I'm sure that Joseph at the time didn't know that, but it became clear to him. For six, for these two years a famine has been in the land, which they, there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting, and God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. And so now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord to all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Notice the terrible events which were happening in Joseph's life, being sold into slavery, being ending up in prison. God allowed this all. He directed it so that he ultimately would be in a position to save thousands upon thousands of people. What about Abraham? What about Abraham? We've heard all about the faith of Abraham, but notice what is being revealed about him in Acts chapter 7, and put yourself in his position. Acts chapter 7 and verse 2. This is what Stephen told the Sanhedrin. He said, Men and brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran, and he said to him, get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Didn't tell him where he was supposed to go. Just tell him, follow me. I will guide you. I will lead you. And then I will get you somewhere. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8 comments on it in this way. Hebrews 11 and verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would afterward receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Think about you. Suddenly God tells you, get out of there, wherever you are, get out of there. And I will direct you to a place you don't even no, it's where it is right now, but you know, you have trust and faith in me. I will ultimately lead you to that place I want you to be. What would our reaction be? Especially if we are very comfortable in where we live and with the status we have. What about Solomon? Now, of course, the relationship between David and Bathsheba wasn't what God had in mind. He didn't want them to have this adultery going on. But nevertheless, he wanted Solomon to be born. He wanted Solomon to be born coming out of a relationship between David and Bathsheba. How can I say this? Because Solomon was predestined, as we will see in a moment. So God knew he would be born. God knew this person would exist. 
Now, God didn't intend it to happen in the way it did, but he was supposed to be born. And God would use him to sit on the throne of David and to build a temple. Another example is Jacob. From the outset, God had determined, decreed that he would inherit the birthright, that he would inherit the blessing, even though he was not the firstborn. But not in the way Jacob went about it. Well, certainly God didn't mean him to cheat and to you know, deceive his father. But nevertheless, he was supposed to inherit it. Now, he could have inherited it in a much more godly way. He didn't want to wait for that. But notice what it says in Romans chapter 9. It's the same with David. He would have had Bathsheba as his wife. Uriah might have de died in a war, whatever. But of course, David went about it all wrong. Jacob went about it all wrong. But the end result was that God carried out his will. Romans chapter 9, verse 10. Not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls, it was said to her, the older Esau shall serve the younger Jacob. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, and Esau I have hated. Hated in the sense, loved less for the purpose of election. Because at that time, God had not decreed that Esau would be called, but Jacob was. You see, God had a plan, and that purpose stood. Jacob should have waited for God's intervention, for God's direction, as David should have had. But they thought they had to do it their way. Think about Queen Esther. Notice the book of Esther, chapter 4. You know the story, right? Here was that evil guy, Haman, and he wanted to wipe out all the Jews. Now, Esther was at the court. She was, she was married to the king. But she was afraid to do something when she found out about that plan. But notice what we read in Esther chapter 4 and verse 13. Then Mordecai, that was Esther's uncle, Mordecai told them to answer Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet you, yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mordecai understood that God had brought her there for the purpose of intervening when it became critical so that the Jews could be saved. And they had to be saved. They had to survive. For instance, for the reason that Christ would be a descendant from Judah. That was decreed. That was known from the outset. And, of course, if all the Jews would have been killed, Christ could have not been born. You see, again, God directed it. He directed something else, a tremendous example of unbelievable foresight. We just heard about in the announcement that an article was just published on God Knows the Future. Notice how he knows the future insofar as First Kings is concerned. And you try to figure this out. No, God knows the future. That's the answer. But he also directs things to happen. First Kings chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. And behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Now, he was worshiping God, uh, false gods, idols. And then he cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, O altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a child, Josiah by name, 
shall be born to the house of David. And on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned on you. Now, would it happen? A child with the name Josiah? Now remember, when this was stated here, there was no Josiah. He wasn't even born yet. But now notice in 2 Kings how this prophecy is fulfilled. Hundreds of years later. 2 Kings chapter 23 and verse 15. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel, and the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin, had made, both that altar and the high place he broke down, and he, meaning Josiah, this king, and he burned the high place and crushed it to powder and burned the wooden image. As Josiah turned, he saw the tombs that were there on the mountain, and he sent and took the bones out of the tombs and burned them on the altar, and he filed it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. You see, whatever that man of God was inspired to say hundreds of years ago would later come to pass. God directed it to come to pass. What about Moses? You know that story, don't you? His parents, to save Moses' life, placed him in a little ark and deposited it in the reeds by the banks of the river Nile. And his sister Miriam was watching from afar. And when Pharaoh's daughter found him, Miriam volunteered to her that Moses' mother would nurse the child. And that's what happened. And later, God appeared to Moses in the burning bush to announce to him that Moses would lead Israel out of Egypt. But an interesting detail is revealed in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 19. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 19. This is what God told Moses from the outset. He says, I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not even by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in its midst, and after that he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be, when you go, you shall not go empty-handed." But every woman shall ask of her neighbor, namely of her who dwells near her house, articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, and so you shall plunder the Egyptians. And when you read the story later, you'll find out that's exactly what happened. But did you know that that was prophesied even hundreds of years prior to that? Because you find that prophecy in the book of Genesis, chapter 15 where God spoke to Abraham. Genesis 15, beginning in verse 12. It says, When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, later Abraham, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. And then he, God, said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge, and afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. Not empty-handed. God had already declared that to occur, as I said, hundreds of years before it actually took place. And not only that, that Pharaoh was not there by happenstance. God had seen to it that the Pharaoh would be in existence when these events would take place. That Pharaoh. First you read in the book of Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 4. Proverbs 16 and verse 4. The Lord has made all things for himself, yes, even the wicked, for the day of doom. And Pharaoh would have been 
a prime example of that. He had to be in power so that God's purpose could be fulfilled. Notice this in Romans chapter 9 and in verse 17. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, even for this same purpose I have raised you up, that I, may sh that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be declared in all the earth. God raised up this Pharaoh so that his purpose as to what he had decreed could be fulfilled. But what Paul, the Apostle Paul, think about him when he was still Saul. Paul thought about it quite a bit. All the things he had done in his life prior to his conversion. All the terrible things he had done. In Galatians chapter 1, and in verse 13, he talks a little bit about it. Galatians 1 and verse 13, he says, For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries and my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I didn't immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed, before God, I do not lie. And afterwards, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was unknown by faith to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but they were hearing only he who formerly persecuted us, now preaches a faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God in me. That was Paul. He was set aside by God already in his mother's womb, he says, to ultimately fulfill a very important purpose. But first, Paul, of course, not knowing any of it, became an enemy of the church, an enemy of Jesus Christ. And we read about his conversion in the book of Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 4. Because now, suddenly, it says in verse 3, a light shone around him from heaven, verse 4. And he fell on the ground, and I heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats, in other words, to rebel against me. Verse 15, here he tells Ananias to baptize Saul, and Saul, of course, had his misgivings. I'm sorry, Ananias, of course, had his misgivings. And so in verse 15, we read, And the Lord said to him, Go, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. That kind of a chosen vessel in the hands of God, but for a long time he didn't understand that. He went his way. You see, God knew him long before he was born. God knows all of us who are called today, and he has known us long before any of us were born. In fact, you can even go back much further. Notice a scripture in Ecclesiastes chapter 6. And so the point is God knew Paul long before he was born. And he let him go his way first until he finally revealed himself in his life. Ecclesiastes 6 and verse 10. It says here, whatever one is, he has been named already. For it is known that he is 
man, and he cannot contend with him who is mightier than he. Now again, a little awkward translation. The NIV writes, whatever exists has already been named, and what man is has been known. What you are today, God knew long before you were born. Jeremiah, chapter 1 and verse 5. Here's another prime example of somebody who was known by God before he did anything. Jacob was known by God before he did anything. Neither good nor bad. Jeremiah 1 and verse 5. Here's what God tells Jeremiah. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, set you aside for the purpose of what? I ordained you a prophet to the nations. He was already sanctified, set aside for the holy purpose of being a prophet to the nations long before he was born. Not sure. I didn't understand that. He said, oh, well, I'm too young. I can speak. And God says, don't tell me you're too, you're too young. I, I called you for this purpose. You're going to do it. He behaved a little bit like Paul, perhaps. Like Solomon, perhaps. Until they finally understood what was going on. What about you and me? Ephesians chapter 1. Beginning in verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, you've got to think that through. I mean, God has chosen you already before this world was even created. God has known you. God has known me before this world was even created? That's what it says. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy. That's the purpose. And without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, where it says, having predestined us to adoption, that's a pretty bad translation. It should be, he has predestined us unto sonship. As, for instance, the new Luther Bible, 2009, brings it. The RSV says, he destined us in love to be his sons through Jesus Christ. And son and daughter is also used in other places. We were predestined by God, foreknown by God, long before we were born. In fact, from the foundation of the earth, but as I show you even prior to that, to be called in this day and age to fulfill our potential to ultimately become God beings when Christ returns. Now you figure that one out. And also, since that is so, God had to watch us. God had to watch our forefathers. He had to make sure that you and I would be even born. And then he would have to make sure that you and I would live until the point where he would call us and that he would give us enough time to fulfill our calling. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 8. It says, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel, according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Now, time is something physical. We were already called in the mind and the, in the eyes of God. In other words, we were already foreknown by God before there was any time, which means 
before there was any physical thing created. Which means, when God created the spirit world, or when God created, let's say, the things within the spirit world, he already knew that he would also create you and me as physical human beings thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years later, whatever time you might want to put in, because there wasn't any time. Now think about that. Think about that. Think about the majesty and the greatness of God. Before time began, God already knew you and me. And so, obviously, when God is for us, nothing can be against us. And I mean nothing. And so in Acts chapter 5, that thought is being expressed quite clearly. When we're talking about the fact that we should leave it to God, let's keep those scriptures in mind, these concepts. Acts chapter 5 and verse 34. Here the apostles were being persecuted by the Sanhedrin and the high priest and the elders and all of those who didn't like what they were preaching. And then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel. Actually, he was a teacher of Paul when he was still Saul. A teacher of the law held in respect by all the people and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Thedeus rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. And he was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. And after this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census, and he drew away many people after him. And he also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. It's actually an interesting piece of advice. I believe our church, the Church of the Eternal God, is of God. I mean, the name is not chosen for nothing. And when the church was established, we were told, oh, you are going to survive maybe for a month, maybe for a few months. Well, those people who told us these things don't say that anymore. Because, you see, if it is of God, it will prosper. If it had been of men, we would long be gone. But that's not only true for the church as a whole, that's true for you and it's true for me. If our life is pleasing to God, we will prosper, we will be protected, we'll be those who are going to be used by God. And no human being can prevent it. Romans chapter 8 and verse 35. Romans 8 and verse 35. Paul's asking the question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. To show you how much God is involved in our lives, and also when it comes to the mere existence of nations. Let's look at a few interesting passages. Acts chapter 17 and verse 26. So this is what Paul is telling the people over there in Greece, I think it is. And he has made from one blood every nation of men 
to dwell on all the face of the earth, and he has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Interesting how the New Luther Bible 2009 translates this. We are of his kind. Now you might recall how Mr. Armstrong used to be talking about the fact that God created animals after the animal kind, he created plants after the plant kind, and he created man after the God kind. And here this translation uses the word, for we are of his kind. Whether they actually knew what they were doing, I don't know. But to me, it was quite interesting. Yes, man is created after the God, kind, because we are supposed to become God beings. That's the potential of man. But we read here that God has predetermined how long nations even should exist and how long they should be in what particular area. He told the same to Abraham. Let's go back to this passage. We read earlier part of it in Genesis chapter 15. So this is when God told him that the Israelites would come back. Because by that time they were not called Israelites yet because Israel didn't even exist yet. But they would come back out of the land which wasn't theirs. God would bring them back. But then when you go to Genesis 15 and read verse 13, God says a little bit more. Genesis 15 and verse 13. Then he said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them for a hundred years, and also the nation whom they shall serve I will judge, and afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. We read that, but let's continue. Now as for you, verse 15, you shall go to your fathers in peace, you shall be buried at a good old age, but in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. See, God allotted a certain time to the Amorites to stay in the promised land until the time would come for them to be thrown out. You find many passages in the Bible where God determines the time, even for nations, to do certain things. In Revelation chapter 17, a prophecy about something which is going to happen soon. Revelation 17 and verse 12. We read about those famous ten kings or ten toes these ten European nations, these core nations, which will unite, and then they will give their power, their authority, to a very charismatic political military leader, the beast. Notice what it says in Revelation 17 and verse 12. And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings, who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour, as kings with the beast. Is one hour defined? Do we know from other scriptures what one hour means? Yes. Turn with me please to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. Daniel 7 and verse 25. Because we know when the beast is in power, he's going to persecute the saints. Bringing about the great tribulation, part of which is the martyrdom of the saints. How long is that going to last? Daniel 7 and verse 25. It says, and he, shall, and he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, shall intend to change times and law, and then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, and times, and half a time. Three and a half years. The time of the Great Tribulation. God has determined that's what's going to happen. 
They will be ruling for one hour, for three and a half years. God determines the length of our life. He determines the time of our death. And that is what we should understand. That's what sometimes we don't understand. Sometimes we may even think, oh, we'll die because of time and chance. That's not what God tells you. Job chapter 14 and verse 5. It says in Job chapter 14 and verse 5, that's something Job understood. Since his days are determined, the number of his months is with you. You have appointed his limits so that he cannot pass. Talking about men. In Psalm 90, Moses is telling us something about the length, the average length of human life. In Psalm 90 and verse 10, he says, The days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for they soon cut off and we fly away, and so on. Now we have to understand the scripture correctly. Moses talked about his time, when he was alive. And he said, at his time, the days of our lives, it's about 70 to 80 years. You see, in ancient times, the days of the lives of men could be all the way up to 1,000 years. And it could very well be that that is also the case in the millennium. When it comes to today, you could say that human beings could reach even 90 years or even 100 years. There have been people who have been even older than 100 years. Well, when you look at the average time, you would also have to include those who are fighting in war and being killed and all of that prematurely. But I'm talking about, you cannot use that scripture and say, oh, therefore, once you reach 80 years, that's it. No, not necessarily. Also, God can lengthen and he can shorten the days of our lives. Notice an interesting passage in the book of Isaiah, chapter 38. In Isaiah chapter 38 and in verse 1, it says, In those days Hezekiah, he was a righteous king. He was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Well, Hezekiah wasn't quite ready for that. Then Hezekiah turned his face towards the wall and prayed to the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And then the Lord, the word of the Lord came to Isaiah saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of David your father, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears, and I will add to your days 15 years. Hezekiah was in the process of dying. He was supposed to die. He prayed. He asked God for more days. And God heard that prayer and gave him 15 more years. In the book of Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 11. Proverbs 9 and verse 11. For by me, it's talking about godly wisdom here, your days will be multiplied, and years of life will be added to you. So you go and start with an average lifespan, and here God says, okay, well, you follow me, you follow and accept my wisdom, I will add life. I will add days to your life. Chapter 10, verse 27. Proverbs 10 and verse 27. Notice again. The fear of the Lord prolongs days. But also notice this. But the years of the wicked will be shortened. See, it goes both ways. And that statement can also be found in the book of 
Psalm 55 and in verse 23. Psalm 55 and verse 23. And let's jump right in the middle of this passage. It says, blood thirsty and deceitful men shall not live out half the days. Yeah, of course. They are bloodthirsty, they go to war, they get killed. They could have stayed alive a lot longer. But God shortened it, or God allowed it, that their lives be shortened. Now when it comes to us, when it comes to those of us who are converted, who are becoming converted, are being called out of this world, we got to understand something. We've got to understand that our lives and our death is precious in God's eyes. And I mean precious. Because God knows what's going on. He watches us. Nothing is going to happen in our lives which God doesn't know. You are not going to die prematurely by time and chance. When you die, when I die, it is because God has decreed that that is a time for us to go. Psalm 72 and verse 14. Here he says, He will redeem their life from oppression and violence, and precious shall be their blood in his sight. It's not something God is not aware of. Psalm 116. And notice verse 15. Psalm 116 and verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Now, first you might look at that and you might say, well, how can that be true? Well, we'll see in a moment why that is true. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Notice Psalm 116. I would just look at that. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah 57, beginning at verse 1. It says, The righteous perishes, and no man takes it to heart. Merciful men are taken away, while no one considers that the righteous is taken away from evil. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds each one walking in his uprightness. They fall asleep within the next second of his or her consciousness. They are alive again. And if they have been converted in this life, they have been those who have received God's Holy Spirit, they will become alive again as immortal spirit God beings. It's in one second. For them, no time has passed. That's why... The death of his saints are precious in God's eyes. Notice Numbers chapter 23 and verse 10. Numbers chapter 23 and verse 10. He's asking the question here, who can count the dust of Jacob or number one-fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of of the righteous, and let my end be like his. Let me die the death of the righteous, because that death is precious in God's eyes. Also notice Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13. Revelation 14 and verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. They won't be forgotten. When Christ comes back, he will reward us for the works we have been doing. It's interesting what Paul's attitude was. I mean, here's Paul who had been persecuting the church, had been persecuting the saints, had had been responsible for the death of many of those 
but then he got converted. And then, of course, he had to go through a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, many trials. But notice what his conclusion of the matter was. Romans chapter 14 and verse 8. Romans 14 and verse 8, he says, For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. We are in God's hands. We are protected. We are secure in God's hands. Whether we live or whether we die, he's talking about. Now, he was confident, of course, that once he dies, within the next second of his consciousness, he would be an immortal God being. And he makes that conviction very well known. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 6, and I'm reading for the 6 to 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6, he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. He knew he would die very, very soon. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He didn't give up. He didn't walk away from God. In spite of all the trials and all the terrible things he had to endure. Verse 8. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, the day of his return, not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. When we love God's appearing, Christ's appearing, when we can't wait for him to return, to make an end to this mess, then we can be absolutely rest assured. If we have died in the faith, we will be resurrected as immortal spirit beings. If we are still alive and Christ returns, we will be changed within the twinkling of an eye to an immortal spirit God being. That's what Paul was convinced of and convicted of. That's what you and I must be convicted of. And if we are, then we are going through life with a confidence in the faith that God is there. Now, sometimes when we go through the trials of life, it will be difficult, it may very well be difficult to concentrate on what's really important. We might be thinking of the terrible things we've got to go through. But no trial, no trial can defeat us when we let God rule our lives. And God is always there to help us. We never walk alone. We are always in God's hands. He knows what's best for us. Notice what we read in Psalm 139, verses 9 and 10. Psalm 139 and verse 9. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. No matter where we go, no matter where we try to go, even Jonah tried to escape from God, and God was right there and said, no, 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 you are doing what I have told you to do. There is no place we can depart. We can try to be hidden from God. But here, the point which I want to make, which is important, how David is stating it, he says, your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. In other words, God will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He will always be with us in our trials, in our problems, in our difficulties. We find that very clearly expressed in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, a scripture we all know very well. But let's read it again. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. And when we go through trials, I think these scriptures which we have been reading together today should help us to not lose focus. Hebrews 13 and verse 5, it says, Let your conduct be without covetousness, be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. 
So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear what can man do to me. Because we know that God is always there. You see, God carries us, literally carries us, in our times of trial. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, we read that God carried the entire nation of Israel. He is carrying you and me today. Deuteronomy 1 and verse 30. The Lord your God, who goes before you, he will fight for you. See, what can man do to me? Let him do our battles and fight our battles. He will fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place. Sometimes you have carried your son. I can't do that anymore right now. He's too old for that. Maybe the grandson I can't. But, you know, God has carried all of us in that way. Through all our trials, through all our problems. Isaiah chapter 46. And verses 3 to 4. He says, listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been upheld by me from birth. Now again, put your name in there. Look at this individually. You have been upheld by God from birth, who have been carried from the womb, carried from the womb, even to your old age. Now that applies to me. Even to your old age, I am he, and even to gray hairs, I will carry you. I have made, and I will bear, and even I will carry, and will deliver you. What a beautiful promise. i like to conclude with reading a poem to you, a poem you probably know quite well. You might have heard it many, many times. You might know it by heart, but I think it's a fitting conclusion for the sermon today. It's titled Footprints in the Sand. One night a man had a dream. He dreamt he was walking along the beach with the Lord. Across the sky flashed scenes from his life. And for each scene, he noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to him and the other to the Lord. And when the last scene of his life flashed before him, he looked back at the footprints in the sand. He noticed that many times along the path of his life, there was only one set of footprints. He also noticed that it happened at the very lowest and saddest times in his life. This really bothered him. And he questioned the Lord about it. Lord, you said that once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I have noticed that during the most troublesome times in my life, there is only one set of footprints. I don't understand why. When I needed you most... You would leave me. And the Lord replied, My son, my precious child, I love you. I would never leave you. During your times of trial and suffering, when you see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. <laughs>